All right. Well, welcome to our little chat here. This is a first for us, so uh, thanks for uh, hanging out with us. Yeah. Excuse the technical difficulties. We're uh, <clears throat> not too uh, savvy with this this stuff, so uh, thanks for bearing with us. Yep. All right. So, well, we got a bunch of questions from, uh, I guess, that you guys sent to Nuclear Blast. So we're going to start with that, and then you guys can also send some questions in online as well. We'll check yeah. those out. Yep. Um, first one was about tours we have coming up. So, as most of you may know here in the states, anyway, we have the uh, the uh, Decibel Magazine tour coming up uh, in May and June. We're going out with uh, the Great Cannibal Corpse and uh, Napalm Death. Both those bands we've known for years, and uh, really cool guys. We know them personally for many years, and obviously great bands. So, totally, we're really looking forward to that. So that's our main our main touring going on this year, as well as. Uh, in a couple of days, we're going over to Holland for the 10th anniversary of the Neurotic Death Fest, uh, which we're really looking forward to as well. Yeah, great, uh, great fest. A lot of good bands. Uh, well, they have great bands every year. So uh, we played a couple of years ago. It was, a, it was a great fest. And then we played a few years before that. So, uh, yeah, so I think it's going to be our third time uh, appearing there. So it's a, it's a good fest. It's a, it's a really fun fest at 013 in Tilburg, Holland. And... Uh, There'll be a lot of great bands there, a lot of a lot of good people there that we know, so it, it should be fun. And then we come home, and then we start the, uh, the Decibel Tour. It starts in uh, Texas, so we're going to start that, I think, on the uh, 10th, right? Next Friday, we start the Decibel yeah. Uh, Tour. So, yeah, so that's the immediate plan. So we're going to be playing a show in December in Costa Rica, our first time down there. Yep, that's right. And then we, uh, we're we going to do a, a headlining run in Europe right now. Uh uh, scheduled roughly for January uh, because we were just there with uh, Marduk uh, in October. We, we were there for like six weeks, so uh, we figured we'd give a little time for the fans to, uh, you know, want us back. <laughs> so. Yeah, I mean, touring sometimes, it's uh, you have to uh, kind of pace yourself with all that as yeah. far as... And it, and it comes down to the, the, uh, the, the promoters and our booking agent, you know, you just need the right timing for all that. So, uh, at this point, we were just waiting for the right timing, and from what we hear, January is the way to go. So it's probably going to be in January. Yeah, we just uh, don't want to overdo our welcome. You know, you can't come through too many times too close together because then it's not exciting for the fans anymore. So at least by the time we go back, it'll be just over a year since we were there, and we'll have like a whole new record of uh, new material uh, for everybody to, uh, you know. Uh, be absorbed in so yeah so january for that so that's the tour plans for right uh, now one more question i see here regarding the tour on the decibel tour is what what is our time going to be your set time going to be on that tour half hour half hour we're going to probably be uh, obviously the first out of the three so it'll be us uh, the napalm then cannibal so i think we have a half hour as far as what we've seen so far uh, yep. on that tour so we're going to do our best to play as much as we can in that, that half hour. That means one thing, <laughs> fast and furious, no yep. stops, like bang, 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 bang. So we're going to try to fit in about six, seven songs, uh, a lot of new stuff. So uh, get ready to hear some uh, some new stuff, stuff off the EP, stuff off of Majesty. We do have uh, a bunch of old songs off of, uh, off of a couple of the older records, but, uh, you know. Yeah, we're limited, we're limited on time, so I yeah. mean. Obviously, you know, we get a lot of fans out there that want to hear the old stuff, uh, but at the same time, I mean, you know, those fans have been around, and I think they probably want to hear us play some new songs, too, <laughs> because we've been playing a lot of the older songs for so many times, so, yeah, uh, you know, and for us, we want, the new stuff is strong, we feel, and uh, we haven't gotten to really play the EP stuff out uh, that much, if not at all, you know, we played a couple of songs here and there on a couple of the last runs, but, um, there's songs from that EP that we haven't played. So, again, this tour is probably going to primarily go uh, through the last three releases, including Kingdom, uh, Providence, and Majesty. And we'll probably sneak in a couple from the older albums. But, uh, again, we don't have a lot of time, so uh, that's just the way it is, folks. <laughs> so, yeah. But, I mean, yeah. we'll definitely do another run here in the States for this record, uh, probably <clears throat> springtime next year. So, you know, whatever you don't get to hear now, you'll, you'll, you know, you may not get to hear next <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. So much stuff to choose from, so we'll see. We'll yeah, see. it's tough. Uh, the more records you put out, the harder it is to get a set list together. Believe me, it's probably the toughest thing in our careers to come up with a set list for every tour. So it's it's difficult, but uh, we try to do our best to please everybody as best we can. Uh, I have another question here about 
talking about touring, about doing a retro tour, doing the whole Dawn of Possession LP in its entirety. Nope. Will never happen. Never happen. <laughs> it's just, we've been asked, we've been asked yeah. to do that before. And, you know, don't get me wrong. We're, you know, we still love the old stuff. I mean, we're, we're super proud of all of our earlier releases, including Dawn. Dawn was the album that kind of, uh, you know, got us, uh, got us on the map. Uh, but, uh, you know, we're not a band, we never were a band to kind of rely on, uh, you know, the, the earlier, uh, you know, music uh, to sustain our career. I mean, I think that we've constantly moved forward and, you know, I think our new stuff is uh, probably our strongest uh, material ever. So, you know, as a band, we like to focus on the new stuff, you know. Um, it'd be different if we totally changed direction and the new stuff w wasn't that great, but I think the new stuff is, is just as strong as the older stuff, you know, and, you know, so that's what we're about. I mean, uh, you know, and listen, we always incorporate songs off of, uh, you know, Dawn of Possession in particular in every tour we do. So we, ne we never forget uh, those songs. You know, we always bring them back. We bring different ones back every tour. But uh, to do that whole album in its entirety is, I, I don't think, really necessary. And it's not something I don't think we'd really want to do at this point, you know, so... Yeah, we have so Sorry. much music, you know, over the course of the 25 years we've been together. And, uh, you know, just yeah. to concentrate on one record, you know, I, like Ross said, I mean, this new, the new stuff is really strong. And once you guys hear the new record, believe me, you'll, you'll see why. I mean, it's one of the strongest things we've done. It's the most aggressive. It's one of the darkest. And, you know... Uh, oh, we hope we hope you think so. I mean, we think so. I yeah. mean, we're you know. I mean, you know, we're not we just saying. Like... <laughs> trust me. Uh, you know, we like we try and do the best we can in what we like, and, and hope that you guys will like it too. And I think we've had a pretty good track record with that. So, uh, you know, we are going to concentrate on on and definitely the newest stuff on this particular tour. Once we have more time as a, head, <coughs> a headliner, and we you know we got it, we have an hour or so. Then when we have that to play with, of course, we're going to break out as many old songs as we can. I mean. Um, at the Neurotic Death Fest, we're definitely going to break out some more older tracks than we can on, on this tour coming up because uh, we have, a, you know, a little bit more time. So, uh, again, you know, that's just how we're doing it. And uh, hopefully everyone will like the songs that we pick and uh, we'll do the best we can to please everybody as best we can. Um, well, I'm going to look at a couple of things that people are writing here just to see. Can uh, you turn, tilt that a little bit? I sure can. Thanks there, champ. No problem there, <laughs> Captain. Okay. All right. Someone wants to know what kind of bass oh, rig base you're using on the upcoming tour. I'm going to use Alex Webster's uh, cabinets. I just got a new uh, GK 700 RB head. Um, I had the old uh, GK 800. Uh, I had it for 20 years. I got it in like 1990, and it uh, went a couple of years ago. So then I got a, a an Ampeg uh, SVT Classic. Uh, it's a tube amp, but the, the tubes aren't really that practical uh, for me uh, live. So I'm going to keep that one for here, and I'm going to take the uh, GK on the road because it's solid state and it's uh, it's a little bit more reliable in that regard. Uh, so, and I've you know I've always uh, played through the GK, uh, the Gallon Kruger. So uh, so yeah, I'll be using that head with um, Alex Webster's uh, cabinets, whatever they may be. I'm guessing he he still uses the uh, the Ampeg, uh, the A10s, so, uh, but I'll see, I don't know what he's playing with these days, so, uh, but yeah, I'll be using his, uh, his cabinets. Yeah, yeah so we're that. all going to be using, like, a, you know, we'll use our guitar heads, and luckily Cannibal has been able to <clears throat> lend us their cabinets, which just makes it a lot easier, uh, a lot of you guys that, uh, girls that know when you're on the road, you know, it, it's easier to just keep things more simple, so being that there's three bands, uh, you know, they were nice enough to, to lend their back line of cabinets to everybody uh, as far as us and Napalm. And it just makes the set times easier and the, the, the changeover is easier. So that's why we do it. Um, and it makes it better for the fans. They don't have to wait as long between bands. So it's just a much smoother process uh, for a show. So for us, it, you know, it makes all the difference. Less equipment we have to take on the road. And again, it makes everything easier at the show. So uh, uh, it's just the way it works out. Really Someone good. else is writing, how was uh, the experience in Chile? Chile was great. Phenomenal. Chile it was our first time down there. We had over a thousand people at, at, at the show, which was just amazing for us. We totally didn't expect that. Um, yeah, I mean, the guys uh, that brought us down there. Uh, best, best guys ever, yeah. man. I mean, they really... Uh, they were awesome people. They took care of us. They they took care of us. We had a great time and we had a lot of fun. It was uh, yeah, it was definitely a, a great trip. 
uh, all everybody we met in Chile uh, were awesome. All the fans. I mean, we met a lot of people. You know, we walked around. We signed a lot of stuff. Uh, saw a lot of great tattoos. A lot of guys had some killer yeah. emo tattoos. Uh, really a cool bunch stuff. of people. You know, so it was good. I mean, and we played a really long set. We played about uh, what twenty. About 20, 21 songs. Yeah. So we played a lot because we'd never been down there. So we figured, you know, uh, you know, we wanted to give everybody down there a little something special. So we went, uh, we played something off of every record, uh, a lot of stuff off of the earlier records, a lot of newer stuff, a lot of stuff in the middle. And uh, yeah, it was, uh, it was a, a nice long set. The crowd was great. It was really, uh, I can't tell you what a great experience it was, truly. It was awesome. I, I, I'd love to go back, you know. Uh, we had a great time. We met a lot of really great people and we made a lot of good friends down there. So, uh, yeah, awesome, awesome. Yep, absolutely. Uh, what else? Did we have a good time in Romania? Absolutely, of course yeah. we did. Romania is great. <laughs> Romania is great. I mean, uh, the, uh, the woman who promotes us there... Uh, uh, this is the second time I think she's promoted a show, and uh, both times it, the shows were phenomenal. I think they were both sold out. They, uh, you know, the crowd was great, savage, just awesome, awesome. Uh, you know, can't, I mean, you know, what more can you say? It was a great show, great people, you know, and the catering was phenomenal. <laughs> yes, <Yeah, laughs> so. definitely some of the best catering. All right, this question definitely is not directed to me. It says, how do you deal with such long hair during long tours? With sink showers. <laughs> I just don't wash it. How about that? <laughs> yeah, it's a pain. It's a pain in the ass. It's a pain in the ass. I, I go, I go many days without washing the mop because I just don't have time. You know, if I have, if I can grab a, you know, a quick sink shower, the hair's the last thing I'm gonna be washing. So it's all metal. It's it's all right. It's all right. I don't have these problems. He don't have these problems. I all saw right. someone say, "What's up from Krakow, Poland?" Oh yeah. What's cool. up, Krakow? You've got a lot of friends in Krakow. We had a great That's time. Right. Yeah. had a great time. Great city. Uh, yeah. Obviously, uh, we, we have spent friends some... there. Crew from uh, Massive. Yep. Um, What's up, Vasek? Yep. And our buddy Kuba. He doesn't live in uh, in uh, Krakow. Close he lives enough. in the uh, woods. So, <laughs> loads. <laughs> but yeah. uh, we spent some time in Krakow after the last tour. We spent a couple of days. And uh, beautiful city. Beautiful city. Um, yeah, it was an uh, awesome time. Yeah, yeah. Good, Good people. food. <laughs> good food, good people, good time. Yeah, you, you'll notice that a lot in what we say. Good food, good food. Yeah. It's all about the food, kids. They want to know what our favorite song from Kingdom of Conspiracy is. And that was from Felipe. Um, um, it's a hard call, I tell you. This album was probably one of the first records that it was really hard for us to get a running order because we just liked all the songs so much, and it was yeah. really tough. Um, I like a, I like a lot of them. It's really hard to pinpoint it, honestly. Um, I, I like, <laughs> it's a hard one. I mean, if I had to pick a couple of favorites, I would pick Kingdom of Conspiracy, of course, the title track, which is why we picked that for the first track. The last track on the album, I think, is just yeah, that's got a good vibe. Epic to it. as fuck. It's uh, all that awaits us is the <clears throat> last track. It's just very dark, very sinister, very bleak. Um, God Complex is another one. I mean, I like them all. It's yeah, hard to it's say. A lot of I mean, I, I, and there's, you know, certain parts of certain songs that I think are just phenomenal. Uh, but yeah, like Bob said, it's our first time coming out of the studio where we were all like, you know, excited and happy and we weren't like, you know, just unhappy and miserable about something. So that's a, that's a first for us. So. <laughs> yeah, normally, uh, as soon as you get out of the studio, there's always a couple of things. You're like, oh, that part could have been better if this or whatever. I mean, you know. Uh, you're always there's always a couple of little things here and there, but uh, yeah, this one pretty much every song, uh, pretty much compared to the pre-production and what we were trying to achieve as far as the parts and how they were supposed to uh, come out, pretty much nailed it, you know, all the way. And then someone even mentioned here about the uh, the production. I just saw. Something. Sorry, we're we're looking at the questions on the other yeah. computer, so that's why we're not distracted. Yeah, these are the live ones coming in, so we're trying. We're to looking at the live well. questions. Uh. Different mastering, dynamic range, uh, someone mentioned. Um, yeah, I mean, well, we've been working with uh, Zach Lohr in the past. This is the third release now. And uh, I think because of that, this is the third time, I think he's gotten uh, the dimension of the of the sound has gotten even better over these releases. From Majesty and Decay to Providence to this one, I think it's just gotten better and better. I mean, you can really hear everything, but it's very powerful. Sure. You hear what's going on on all the instruments. Uh, but the feeling and the emotions there and the power of the music is there, which is something that... Uh, you know, in our earlier releases, you know, they had a unique sound, but there was just something that was missing as far as that power, as far as a lot of the detail, totally. you know. So 
Um, although, you know, some of the earlier records, I, I, I like uh, some some of the production, but overall, like the newer stuff, we really love a lot, and it's really, it really brings out the dynamics and the music that we try to create with the different layers of the guitar work and the drums and everything. There's a lot going on, so totally. In order to have all that audible. You know, yeah. it was pretty difficult, yeah. but Zach really, uh, with Paul, you know, working in the studio and then Zach doing the mixing and mastering, it's really come uh, a long way, yeah. which we're really happy about. The two of them together is, uh, it's a perfect combination. I mean, you know, here's the deal. We've never, like, we've never had our fans either, uh, you know, either all love the production or, you know, or all be on board with the production. There's always someone who's critical of some aspect of our production. And, uh, you know, the earlier days, we kind of went the more organic uh, route. Uh, and now we try to tr try to change it up a little bit and do something different. We got Zach on board and now the production, although it's not overly polished, it does have a better um, clarity to it. So you can hear everything that's going on, which is something I think that we somewhat lacked in the past. Uh, not entirely, but, uh, you know, because it was much raw and much more organic, you know, certain things, uh, you know, suffered a little bit. So, uh, you know, the combination of Paul and Zach now, I think we've, uh, you know, we've kind of achieved like, you know, uh, what, we were, what we were shooting for to try to get that, that sound the way it needed to be. So, of course, you know, some people aren't going to like it because they think it's a little over polished or, or this or that. And that's fine. We understand that. I mean, production is a very personal thing. You know, I, you know, I, I come from the old, uh, we all come from the old school days of, the, you know, cassette demos where the productions were horrible, but it didn't matter. I mean, it was just raw and dirty and it was about the feeling, you know, and, uh, you know, and you, you get that with uh, something that's well produced as well. It's just, it, there's a fine line, you know. So, you know, we're happy with uh, what Zach did on this last record, of course. Uh, we think it really does justice to the songs. I mean, so it's powerful. And like Bob said, it is very dynamic. So, you know, hopefully you guys dig it, you know. All right, we're like trying it. to go through some of these because they're coming. There's a lot of questions coming now. Out, so. so, first of all, I just have to say that. Uh, Let's uh, try to go. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, yeah. Well, I just want to say, you know, Bill's Bill's sister wrote in. She says to come to Omaha. So. Oh, hey, doing? what's up? <laughs> uh, let's see what else we got here. I'm gonna go back a little bit just to see where we're at here. Uh, Favorite song from Kingdom. We got that one. Let's see. Let's see. New Zealand. Though we're coming to uh, planning on coming to New Zealand. We're trying to work out some stuff for the Australia yeah. New Zealand kind of run. Uh, maybe. Earlier next year, we're in touch with someone over there now, so hopefully it'll work out. So uh, keep your fingers crossed on that one, because we definitely want to try and get to that area, um, as well as uh, we're hoping to get to Asia sometime soon too. It's 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 been difficult because you have to go through the right people, and the timing has to be correct, and there's a lot you have to do uh, with paperwork, etc., to to get into the countries to do stuff from over there. So uh, so in time, we're hoping to get there next year. It is in the works. Um, so hopefully soon. Uh, let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Uh, somebody asked. Uh, oh, here's about... a good one. Is it very difficult touring when everyone in the band has an ordinary job? Huh. Yeah. It's yeah. A pain in the it ass. can be. I mean, it's difficult. We're very lucky uh, that we have jobs we can go right back to when we get home. So we're very lucky in that respect. So. Um, it can be difficult at times, the timing, you know what I mean? Like this last summer, we were gone for months. So, you so know, June it, to like it a took lot. a toll on, you know, where Ross is working, where I'm working, because uh, both of us, as far as we go, uh, you know, we're a couple of the main people at the companies that we work for. So it is a little difficult, and you kind of almost feel guilty saying, all right, well, I'm going I'm to be gone for the next five months, you know. And, and luckily, the bosses we have understand that, because uh, going into this, uh, going to both these jobs when we did, uh, they both understood that right from the get-go as far as what we did. So, you know, we're we're lucky. Um, it's just even even just doing normal stuff like uh, practicing or or doing oh, the press yeah. for the record is yeah, becomes difficult. yeah it becomes a, a pain in the ass because. You know, Bob and I work 11, 12 hours a day. You know, you get home at seven, seven thirty some nights, and you have a very small window of time to rehearse for the tour. To do email interviews, uh, which you know, if you guys don't know, they're a pain in the ass because you got to sit there and type out the questions. <laughs> yeah, we got a lot. This, these last few weeks have been just ridiculous because we've had email interviews, we've had phoner interviews. I'm sitting there on Skype on my cell phone, going to work, doing interviews with Europe, and then 
you know, working on the video trailers for us, uh, working my job, which sometimes the last job I just had, I, I started at 9 a.m. in the morning and I got home 7 a.m. the next morning. So, you know, with the production jobs, I'm working 24 hour days sometimes. So, and then you shot the next day, of course. And then, so you're, you're trying to do all these things and re rehearse at the same time. So it's just, it's a lot. I mean, we do what we have to do. I mean, don't get me wrong, but, uh, it can be a, a challenge, to say the least. It's just not easy. I mean, you got to want to do it. I mean, you know, I mean, we enjoy, obviously, we enjoy doing what we do. We enjoy doing the press and rehearsing and all that stuff. It's just the time, you know, and sometimes you're just so tired, you know. So, uh, you know, but, you know, unfortunately, you kind of you kind of have to juggle the two, you know. I mean, living close to Manhattan, I mean, it, things aren't cheap here and. uh you know, you gotta you gotta make a living somehow. So we need to work. We need our jobs. And uh, like Bob said, our, our 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 bosses are very cool and they're very flexible. And we're very fortunate. So uh, you know, knock on wood. You know, we're still able to do it. Look, Jeffrey wrote. <coughs> hey, What's up, missed Jeff? it. Hey, guy. <laughs> hey, buddy. He says, "Do you agree that the central theme of immolation is, is the a hidden... hidden hand of darkness, Satan in many forms?" Absolutely, absolutely, and we, we've Jeff and I have talked about this uh, just recently. Uh, there's always that uh, underlying theme of uh, the darker side of humanity, you know, and uh, it's it rears its ugly head in many ways, uh, you know, in in many forms, religion, war, um, just where we're headed as people, you know. I mean, so yeah, that is a, a, has always been a big theme in our music. It it was never, um, you know. People kind of misconstrue our lyrics and think they were satanic in the beginning, but they never were. I mean, we were very anti-religion and uh, including Satanism. I mean, we're very um, we we're very much against that. We're against anything that controls, you know, people. And that was uh, that was our feelings on that. But it was like Jeff said, it, it goes much further beyond, uh, much beyond that. You know, it is about this darker side of of humanity and, and life in general. And that's kind of what we've honed in on for the last twenty five years. You know. We're really not that miserable of people. But <laughs> yeah, but this music is, uh, you know, when it comes to the music, I mean, that's kind of where we get our serious side going. I mean, as you can see, you know, normally we're pretty much just buffoons, but uh, when it comes to uh, the music, then we get serious, you know. And, and you know, we do look at the darker side of life and mankind, and, and that's what it's about for us. To, this music to us has always been dark. It always needs to have that dark feel, dark atmosphere. And, you know, whether you're talking about the establishment or religion or just, just everything that, 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 that Ross said, like, tends to, uh, you know, try and control and manipulate others. And that's kind of like a, an overall theme we've had over the years. And, Absolutely. and we just try and look at it from different perspectives and, and as we go. And I think we get better at it as we do with the music i think the more albums we do the better we get at you know both the music and the lyrics and how to kind of like uh uh bring that all into oh, hang on i'm having a little trouble here with the uh, computer folks hang on one second so yes jeffrey that's uh jeffins <laughs> this is true okay Let's jeffins <laughs> jeffrey where are we uh, start? Now. How is it recording an EP for Psy and AV? Do you think they will continue to make an impact in metal? Yeah, I think so. I mean, it was great. It was a real great experience for us. Um, we first did the uh, pretty much they supported a local show in uh, New York here, a one off that we don't normally do. And uh, that show went great. So then after that, I think, uh, what was it, January of 2011, roughly, or early 2011, March, maybe, I forget, when we did the uh, Oh, the, the, the Cyan, the Fest in, uh, where the hell was that? Pomona, California. Pomona. Pomona. So they did this whole festival, which they do every year in different parts of the United States, and they support, you know, all kinds of music, and that particular day is the metal day, and I mean, the one that we played had Obituary, Municipal Waste, Morbid Angel, us, a bunch of other bands, and they had like a... Uh, two venues involved as well as two large tents and took up a, a few blocks and closed them off and you know kids just got them for free and it was, it was that, a great time it was like a mini so, Euro fest you know but the main thing is it was free to the fans yeah. and uh, anything they do um, is geared towards the fans and the musicians which is uh, very unique these days I mean when they when they approached us we had a good working relationship with them from the shows we did with them and then they uh, they gave us money to record the um, Glorious Epic video, uh, which we did with Tommy Jones, and it came out really, really good. Uh, and after that, they approached us to do the EP, 
and uh, part of the agreement was that it was to be released for free for a year to the to the fans uh, to download, as well as they were going to make a, a bunch of uh, physical copies, uh, CDs and vinyl, for us to give out at the shows. So you, you can't say no to that. That's it's a phenomenal deal. We didn't have to pay them back, so they pretty much funded it. They gave us the stuff to give out for free, which we did, and it was uh, you know it was a gift to the fans, really. So y you can't say no to that. I mean. Whether you're, uh, you know, you're not for, uh, you know, uh, a corporate entity like that getting involved in something that's uh, like this underground, what they did was really, uh, really very unique, and it really benefited us and you guys. So it was a positive thing, and I think the EP. I mean, we we put a lot into the EP. We wanted to make it special for the release. Uh, you know, Bob wrote the five brand new songs for the EP. We didn't we didn't want to approach it with the mindset that you know we'll we'll you know we'll re-record some old stuff and maybe throw some live tracks that's you know that, yeah, that's nonsense us, it was know? like uh it was just like any other release it was like approaching an album only it had less songs so yeah. you know for us it was more like okay let's just write five of the best songs we can at that time just like we did with this last record so you know we don't like to uh deal with covers and stuff like that we were just more sure. concerned with writing great songs and, and getting it out there to the fans so and, the, and it was cool and a lot of the people over there were fans of the music they were fan immolation fans and you know i'm sure they were the ones who were pushing for this so yeah man i mean it was it was awesome and we would most certainly work with them again they've they've, they've treated us like gold you know they're really good people to work for and they've done everything they in their power to to help this band so yeah, so uh, you know, in the future we'll see, but uh, yeah, we uh, the EP was a was a really uh, good experience for us, you know. So. Someone yeah. was asking about Bill's guitars. Where does Bill get those cool Ibanez guitars from, Mister Mortem ninety three? He he finds them online. He buys them. You know, he he's collected them over the years, right? Yeah, he collects he collects them over the years, but he also Bill is the master of customization. So he gets the guitars, but then he tricks him out all himself you know he yeah he, he's really crafty like that and uh and he enjoys it you know it's very unique to him and uh he loves it he puts a lot of time and effort into it so just about with every you know release or tour that we do you know pretty much every tour run he's always got something different totally. going on with his guitars which is great i, I think it's awesome you know well, he's, i, I yeah. wish i could do that yeah. <laughs> you know well, he's uh He's about every aspect of the performance, the live performance, right down to the guitar and how it looks. I mean, so he really takes his time and, you know, he, uh, you know, when you see the guitars, I mean, everything on the guitar is, you know, he, he'll always add little personalized uh, yep. little things on the guitar that are just, you know, b you know, billisms, <laughs> you know, so it's And he great. tries to actually do things, you know... Uh hints of stuff that 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 have to do with the the release that we're touring for so sure it's kind of cool and I, it's cool to, to see that people notice that because he does totally. really put a lot of uh work into that stuff yeah. and he loves those guitars i mean they're yeah. an older model guitar and uh ibanez i don't think they don't make that that model anymore so yeah he's been collecting them he must have oh, at least 10 or more so every every time we go out he uh brings out a new you know pair for rotation so uh yeah that's uh that's to deal with that. Someone was asking about what is uh, the best album? What is your what is the best album you guys have released personally? Um, I don't know. I, I'm gonna go with the new one yeah. because I'm always uh, that one in Providence. I mean, I love Majesty too, but I'd say definitely the the last three are my favorite as far yeah. as overall records. Yeah. I mean, don't get me wrong. Right. There's a lot of stuff. The old stuff I love, you know. We're, we're proud of everything. Yeah, but close you gotta... to the world below. Uh, even Harnessing Ruin, you know, the production wasn't the best in the world, but I think the songs were great. Um, you know, we love all our stuff, you know. It's like we like the newer stuff because, you know, it's new to us, and I, I think it's got a lot more energy and power, and and, uh, and the productions, of course, help that as far as we're concerned. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that's, that's, that's it for us. But, of course, we love the old stuff, too. There's a lot of old classic songs we love, so it's hard to really pinpoint, you know, a, a particular favorite album because when we go out and we play, you know, a set, that includes stuff from you know all the different records and that set flows good it's kind of cool because we like you know you're dealing with old and new songs that kind of flow together really well and so uh, i couldn't really say anyone's particularly the ultimate favorite you know because we we do like all our stuff oh yeah i mean the we like all the records obviously and we're proud of all the records but you know from our point of view because uh, you asked for a personalized answer from from my perspective i enjoy the newer stuff because it's fresh it's uh you know it's it's 
not something we've been playing for 25 years, so it's definitely uh, more fun for us to play, I think. And it's a little more challenging, you know? It's like learning the new songs, you know? You're always kind of challenging yourself, you know, to move forward. So, yeah, I mean, that's why I, I enjoy the new stuff. All right, so when a couple of people asking about the logo situation. Well, the logo situation is as such. <laughs> it's like basically uh, from Failures for God's On, we use the uh, the newer logo. And it really has to do with the artwork and how it works with the artwork because we've noticed the logo, the original logo that we have, which we still use to this day, um, on the covers, it's just it, it's very hard to get it in such a way where it's it either becomes too small or too large and, and destroys all the artwork. So... It um, just doesn't work well with the artwork. It's very difficult. So what we do now is uh, we use the... This doesn't work well. Oh, hang on a second. How am I getting this out? Let me mute that. Thank you. There you go. So anyway, um, for the records, we use the newer logo, which is a little bit more straightforward. And uh, we like it because it, it has a strong look of its own. It's simpler, but it has a strong look. Um, but the older logo we use for, you know, whether it's merchandise or sometimes within the, the releases, we have it on the inside where it works better. It's just the way it is. Um, so we haven't, you know, disowned it. We always use it to this day. If you come out and see us, we'll have shirts with that logo on it. No doubt about that. It's just that for us, it, it always interferes with the artwork. It just doesn't quite work on that. You know, when you have a, a small CD and you're trying to do the logo in the artwork, it, it's very hard for the... Uh, the artwork to be represented well with that the logo you know being in the way and it just doesn't work as far as we're concerned and even you know some of the guys at the record label they would push for the old logo and then when they see the uh uh what the uh what do you want to call it the test runs for the the you know the record for the album cover. oh yeah like the mock-ups the mock-ups they agree at like yeah yeah you're right you know it doesn't work well know? totally i mean the guys at the label uh you know gerardo and charles who work in nuclear blast here in the u.s they're always pushing for the old logo and like come on guys use yeah. it and they'll we actually try. we try we look we, we, we look at the mock-ups but it just never works for us it just doesn't right. have that the right feel uh, on the record totally and even when they see the mock-up with the old logo they're like yeah not so much you know let's use the uh, the newer logo it just looks better it doesn't uh, distract uh, from the artwork so so there's there's a method to our madness it's not like we don't like the old logo I mean when when you come to see us live we always have the old logo shirts because I love the old logo the old logo sick you know that was done by uh, a good friend of ours back in the day, you know, back in 1988, a fellow by the name of Mark Mastro, who used to be in a band called Rotrevore, and uh, he did that logo for us, and it was, uh, you know, we love the logo. Uh, we still use it, like Bob said, it's on the CDs, so it's just not on the front. <laughs> uh, question about for coming to Columbia. Well, we'll see. I mean, we just got to Brazil and Chile, so, you took know. us tw uh, 25 years <laughs> to get to Brazil and Chile, so hopefully it won't take us 25 years to come to Colombia, guys. So, we know there's a lot of fans down in Colombia. There's a lot of Colombian guys and gals here in New York City that we talk to all the time, and, you know, they always want to know when we're going to be heading down to Colombia. So, um, you know, hopefully it'll happen soon, you know. We, we kind of get interest here and there, but nothing solid. So, you know, we'll see. We'll see. Someone's asking about the difference sound-wise between the vinyl and the CD of the new record. Well, we haven't heard the vinyl yet, so. <laughs> but usually, for some reason, vinyl always sounds better. Vinyl always sounds it warmer. Always does. Always sounds warmer. That's just a fact. You know, it'll it'll definitely sound different. I mean, I prefer vinyl because of the sound. You know, the the warmth of it. You know, uh, when when digital first or when CDs first came out, I just wasn't down with CDs. You know, at all. They just uh, had a weird sound to me. But, you know, you you kind of. Uh, you grow to accept them because you have no other choice, you know, yeah, so. That's the way it is. Someone was asking about how often do we play locally, I guess. They mentioned Long Island, but we're not so much near Long Island. We but, don't, uh, yeah. Uh, local shows, we don't do that often. Uh, the last local show we did as a one-off was that one for Scion back in 2010, maybe. Yeah. Um, just because Bill lives in Florida, Steve lives in Ohio, to you know, and to do a show locally here, it just... We wait for the tours to come, and then, you know, we come through New York. Uh, it's just a little bit, it makes more sense, you know. I mean, if we all lived in New York, then maybe we'd do, you know, we, maybe we do a one-off now and then for the hell of it, but it's just not feasible right now because we just, 
everyone's spread out, uh, so it just makes more sense to wait for the tour to come. Well, yeah, it just it becomes real. Uh, it becomes a big expense to get the guys <clears> up here. <clears throat> then you got to stop everything just for one. It's easier for us to get together and do uh, a tour, and we usually hit New York as part of a tour. That's how it's you know generally been, aside from the uh, one-off we did with Cyan a couple of years ago, which was fun. Don't get me wrong, but you know, it's just uh, it's just easier to do it as part of a tour. You know, really. Let's see. What age group do we attract the most? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing you mean at our shows. Uh, uh, it's it, varied. Yeah, it does vary. Any, any, anywhere from 12 to 14 year old kids to, uh, you know, people like our age in their in their early to late 40s. I mean, you know, you get, you know, you get a, a wide range of ages uh, at our shows, which is good. I mean, I, I really like to see the younger people there because it tells me. Uh, we have new blood in the scene, you know, and it's good to see the diehards come out, like the guys our age come out. To, I mean, because we still, I, I go to shows all the time here. That's I live for that, you know. I, I like to see, uh, I like to see the bands that I, I enjoy come through, and uh, we know so many bands now. It's it's uh, it's a big social event when we go to a show, so it's it's fun, you know. We enjoy it, but uh, yeah, I think the ages vary, you know. Uh, someone was asking about the seventy thousand tons of metal. Uh, what was it like on that? And, uh, yeah, that was pretty incredible, actually. I don't know if anyone's out there has been on it, but, um, that particular cruise slash fest was, uh, was really something else. Definitely an experience for us. Okay. <laughs> oh, you're hitting it with your arm, I think. Okay. That's what's going on. All right. Ah. Anyhow, um, yeah, it was really cool. I mean, uh. Just to be on the boat. I mean, that was our my first cruise personally, and uh, all of us to be out out there and then have it to be a festival, a metal festival at the same time was pretty amazing. Surreal. Uh, yeah, totally. So uh, if anyone hasn't gotten on it yet, I would suggest definitely checking it out. Um, you know, uh, there's always bands playing all night long. It's always a party. It's always a good time. Everyone's just around watching bands. Totally. Uh, yeah, it's just it, it's pretty wild. And then. For us to play, when you're out on the deck playing on a ship, you know, I mean, it was, you know, I mean, they set it up very professionally, but the fact is, you know, you're looking out there and, you know, you're on a boat. <laughs> so yeah. it was pretty wild. It, it's like, just picture, uh, you know, a, a metal festival on a ship. That's exactly what it was. All like a few thousand metal people on a ship. Uh, it was just great. No matter where you went or, or, or ventured on the ship, there was just metal was everywhere. It was great. It was like, it was very cool, very cool, you know. And they did some cool things. They had like this uh, all-star jam where they had like, you know, different members of different bands kind of like do cover songs, which was kind of cool. They had the karaoke every night, which I love because that's when the fans kind of went up there and, and uh, oh, that was hysterical. and just just went for it. I mean, there were some some guys and gals that were just like, just total characters, man. They they really nailed it, and it was funny and entertaining. And yeah, I spent a lot of time there at nights just because uh, it was it was fun, you know. And then we saw uh, uh, Vika. Vika goes wild. She does piano covers of metal bands. She yeah. was like uh, one of the highlights of the tour for sure. I mean, for the cruise. Yeah. And she actually had done a, a piano cover of the song Close to World Below. So yeah. she actually if performed you that a couple of times. So for us to see her do it live was really cool. So that was that was a lot of fun. Hey, if you guys haven't seen that, just go on YouTube and type in uh, Close to World Below piano cover and you'll see her doing uh and she actually played it twice on the cruise i got we got to see her perform it live and it's but she does all kinds of stuff she does like carcass songs metallica songs uh she's all over you know yeah, i made death uh, metal to regular heavy metal yeah, yeah. so it's uh yeah definitely uh i think a lot of people were surprised uh, when they saw her because a lot of people didn't know who she was and they'd be walking through the main corridor and then hear metal songs on piano and people would just start to gather so it was pretty cool well, yeah it was cool and there was a lot of classic bands on there as well you know i mean uh i got to see um oh, creator played on there creator played i got to see metal church uh you know and the, the new singer is uh man he killed it just like the the original singer because i seen them uh for the first record they opened up for metallica uh wow a long time ago and they were they were phenomenal they killed it so they were really good um, got to see Onslaught perform uh, The Force, the second album, in its entirety, which was uh, really cool. They were really cool guys. We, we played with them before over in, uh, in Europe. Uh, so we got to see those guys, and I actually got to see them do that set. 
so yeah, we just kind of roamed around and check out little, you know, snippets of bands here and there. But uh, yeah, there was definitely uh, those were some of the highlights for for us, I think. All right, let's see here. I'm trying to look through some of the other questions now. Let's see. Hmm. Let's see. Vancouver. Yeah, we're looking forward to Vancouver. That should be cool. Um, the Commodore Ballroom. I don't know. We we played a, a couple of bigger places up there in the past uh, with Deicide and with Cannibal, but uh, it's been so long since uh, we've been up there. I can't remember. But uh, yeah, looking forward to it. Uh, it's nice that we have more of an extensive Canadian run because I remember when we announced the uh, the uh, the the North American tour for the uh, Providence, we had one show in in Canada, yeah. Toronto, and all the Canadians were giving us shit for that. They're like, "Oh, what the hell? That's no North American tour. That's a not yeah. our fault. We don't book them. We don't <laughs> we don't book it. So, uh, but this we time we did. We'd make a lot more stops. But uh, so this time, I'm happy we're going to be doing a lot more in Canada, which is cool because uh, you know. Ah, the Canadian fans are great. Every time we go up to Canada, whether it's uh, east, west, or in the middle, it's uh, always, always good. So, yeah, we're looking forward to it. Let's see. Uh... All right. I'm trying to find a good one here. Yeah, we're just looking through some of the questions that are coming in. Uh... Oh, that was a good one. What bands inspired you to play death metal? Well, I mean, you know, when we in the early days, definitely a band like Possessed for sure was a, a big Possessed. inspiration. Um, um, Merciful we Fate also grew up with bands like Destruction and stuff like that. All that earlier stuff, definitely. Uh, creative Voivod, although you know, not entirely exactly death metal, but I mean, it was all underground. It was all to us. It was all from the same thing. You well, know? yeah, that was they all, had a, they all had a unique style or sound, and um, that was our era. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So. So for us, there was some of those types of bands, as well as you know everything, just playing metal Maiden. in general. Maiden, Maiden, Priest, even earlier Metallica, Slayer, of course. Uh, you know, this just you just progressively get into the heavier stuff, totally. and then by the time we started our own group, we were you know already into heavy stuff, and we just tried to yeah. take it to the next level, you know, and that's really what it was. It's probably no different, uh, you know. From, you know, the way you guys, I mean, we're, we're fans too. I mean, we, you know, the only difference is we actually were retarded enough to continue playing in the band <laughs> for 25 years, but, but we're fans too. I mean, we started out just like probably everybody else who's, who's watching this right now. I mean, you know, got, getting into stuff like, uh, you know, Judas Priest, early Priest and early Maiden. I mean, Harris, uh, Steve Harris was the reason why I play bass today, you know? Uh, so yeah, I mean, and then it, like Bob said, it progresses, you get from, uh, stuff like that, and, you know, from Maiden and Priest and Queensryche, you know, even earlier stuff like Van Halen and Cla I love classic rock, Zeppelin's like one of my favorite classic rock bands, uh, Pink Floyd, and then you, you, you progressively get into heavier stuff, you're always, um, seeking out heavier stuff that's how it was you know it was like uh you know you find a, a couple of friends and who are into the same thing and that's it man you just you know you'll you'll buy things like wow this looks heavy check it on you know you know, wow this looks a hellhammer this looks great you play it it's phenomenal and then they become celtic frost and then you know you see venom's uh you know welcome the hell album you buy that and then you're like wow this is so that's how it is you know you, you just progressively get heavier but uh, yeah, like Bob said, possessed was uh, that was uh, like a defining moment. You know, we're like, wow, this this is this is what we were meant to do. What these guys are doing, you know? yeah. Because I mean, they just had that that Seven Churches record is just so right. Has such a dark, unique feel to it. And I think even today, when you listen to it, you can sit there and be like, wow, this is you know, this is pretty sick. <laughs> so I mean, and then obviously all our other influences come into play too. You know, like we were talking about the earlier, you know, the Maiden stuff and all that. So um you know i mean guitar wise i always like all different kinds of bands so i always you know with us i always try and do melody but not so much you know we like to try doing dark things with it you know it's like for 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 what we do you know i try and make it as musical as possible but at the same time you know uh, you want to keep it dark you want to keep it uh to have that dark atmosphere and that's kind of like you know, with those earlier records like that, like Possessed, uh, for instance, they had that really dark atmosphere, but then the solos would be going, just going wild and, you know, do all sorts of uniquely crazy stuff, as well as the drums, you know, they had a very unique thing going on, which I, I always thought was cool how they would follow some of the riffs with the drums and everything, and it was it was kind of cool, and uh, 
So yeah, I mean that's where it all comes from, you know. It, like Russ said, it just it naturally progresses, and then you just keep listening to heavier stuff. And once we got rolling, I mean, we knew we, what we wanted to do, and and that's what we continue to do today. Just continue to try and you know build upon that and make it you know better. Not necessarily always just more extreme, but more interesting, uh, uh, different every time. I mean, I don't know. We just try and do the best we can to make the best songs we can uh, musically, as well as having you know you know as much meaning as possible so <laughs> charles elliott have you ever seen steve without his hat of course <laughs> of course we have we're probably the only ones <laughs> uh let's see how you doing charles <laughs> charlie uh, this will dawn Superstar. California. Oh, Charles superstar. is a total superstar. Charles is a superstar. Charles Go to like Elliot. much music or music choice on TV and you see his video come up every other five minutes and talks all about Charles. <laughs> Charles Elliott did this. Charles Elliott did that. He's a superstar. Total superstar. He's more of a superstar for dealing with our nonsense on a daily basis. <laughs> wee, wee. It's like him, Gerardo, Rob and Mike. Man, those guys are all right. They deal with a lot of our, our crap. Dominican <laughs> Republic. Um, sure, we come to the Dominican. We, we'll play anywhere. You know, we have to, you know, if you guys have promoters down there, <laughs> have them contact our, our agent over here, First Row Talent. You know, make it happen. Make it happen. All right. Let's see. We're dealing with two different sets of questions. Here, yeah. So pancakes. To... Hey, don't mess with my pancakes. We like pancakes, but we're not writing a song about them. Sorry. Uh, looking forward to June 4th in Brooklyn. June 5th. Get the, get the nice. date right. <laughs> June 5th. At least man. you'll be there the day before, so you'll know yeah. when you can go the next day. But That's this, right. It's June 5th. It's June 5th. <laughs> Let's see. Yeah, we're looking forward. Brooklyn show should be good. Uh, oh, yeah. I mean, the local shows we always look forward to. Because we get to have, you know, our friends out and everything. So it's always a good time. And uh, I don't think we've played that particular place before. It's uh, Williamsburg Music Hall, I believe. Is that Williamsburg right? Music Hall. I think it's June 5th. Uh, so, yeah, so we definitely, I mean, yeah, like the New York shows for us are always really, uh, they're always special shows. Because like Bob said, we have all of our friends, uh, our families. Uh, it's a, It's always a good night. But there's also a lot of pressure that night because all our friends and family. Exactly. Are here, so. So, well, I hope this show is going to be good. Exactly. <laughs> How often do you have a chance to rehearse as a full band? We don't rehearse as a full band anymore. Uh, mm -hmm. Honestly, we don't. Um, just we, we just don't have time. So like I like I was saying earlier, uh, I'll come home from work and I'll just play. We'll, we have our set list already picked, and then uh, yeah, I just play the songs on my stereo and rehearse with the bass and I sing along, you know, alone, of course. Otherwise, you know, <laughs> the neighbors might think I'm a retard. But, uh, so yeah, we rehearse at home. But that's what's great about this lineup. Uh, the four of us are very, um, are very driven and motivated and we don't have to babysit anybody. Um, so we all practice on our own and when we get to the, to the first show or to the studio, we're, you know, we usually you know good to go there's always a couple of kinks that have to be worked out but uh luckily there's no derailments so yeah. <laughs> that's the main thing as long as there's no derailments we're all right you know hello yeah. from russia oh it's morning in russia well it's it's evening here but uh thanks i hope we could uh do some more extensive uh playing in russia you know we've never really you know been uh into russia i'd like to play uh you, you know got to the ukraine but not russia got yet. close we got to the ukraine <laughs> and uh, latvia and lithuania but nothing uh you know in, inside russia you know so hopefully this year we'll see we had a couple of opportunities but we couldn't get the uh, visas worked out in time so we did have plans to do about a week and a half two weeks in russia you know so uh yeah, hopefully soon. So uh, just keep posted. Uh, you know, we, we always think about it. So, you know, hopefully it'll happen this year. Yep. And Oakland Metro, someone's seen us at. That's a cool place. I know we've been there before. I wow. Mean, was it the Oakland Metro? Maybe I'm thinking of another Metro. Was that, that the might place be we played a long time ago? Could be. Not sure. Wow. But it was a good show. I know that. <laughs> Oakland was definitely a good show. 92, we played in Oakland, our first tour. And it was a very popular place. I don't know if it was the Metro. It might have been the Metro. I don't know. I don't know how old this venue is. So, Cool, cool. Right. What else? Uh... 
care for now. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, mm. Hmm. Given your evolution in sound and riffs composition when it comes from rehearsing and finally recording in the studio, how careful are you about the loudness war in the recording process? I'm not sure what the loudness war is. Oh, just everything louder than everything else. Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah. in the studio, okay. in the recording studio, we don't have to worry about that. Yeah. And in rehearsal, we don't rehearse, so we don't have to worry about yeah. that either. <laughs> but we're not... Um, we're not one of the ba one of these bands that just everything's on eleven in the rehearsal room because it it serves no purpose. You'll come out deaf <laughs> at the end of the uh, session. So yeah, I mean, for us with the recording, we try and the idea is to hear everything somewhat equally because everything plays an important role. I mean, the drums play an important role. The guitars, uh, even the bass. You want to have that underlining bass feel, and the, of course, the vocals will have to be there because you know what's being said has to be heard. So. Um, it's it's a it's it's a fine line. It's hard to get all that together, especially as you know with this kind of music. It's probably extremely difficult, more than any other kind of music out there, I'm sure. Um, so I mean, I think again, like we talked about earlier, the last three releases, I think you know with uh, Zach Warren on it, I think he's done quite a good job in in balancing that out, where uh, you really have some good sounds. I mean, someone was asking about the guitar rig too, as far as what we use uh, um, guitar wise. I mean. In the studio, I used uh, my my uh, the uh, the head that I have. Um, I can't remember the, the name of that now. Right. I didn't use uh, I the PV. Think, yeah, the PV triple X. I've used that, but I also sometimes use the dual rectifier too. So I got confused yeah. which one. But this time, I think it was just the PV triple X. And then we used um, uh, what was that one that Paul had? He had uh, one in his studio that we also used. Oh, uh, it's a small one, right? Yeah, I can't remember the name. It was an old, like, a vintage. Paul has a lot of, like, classic, old-school, original gear in the studio, which will, you know, will break out during the recording session uh, and various records, which we have in the past. So, uh, it just depends from record to record. And we try them out. And the, the funny thing is, is that you go through all that, and, you know, the sounds are really good, but sometimes, uh, like with this, we ended up... Zach, or uh, I think he had the other guy, uh, was it Ola? Um, you know, he, they end up reamping the stuff anyway. And sometimes I think they use partial reamp, partial natural guitar work uh, sounds and put that together that gives it the sound it needs in the recording. So to be honest with you, this album probably has a cross between what I just mentioned as well as reamps that I couldn't even tell you what they were because they weren't done here. Um, the ultimate goal is to... What does it sound like, you know? Because honestly, I could care less if they if they reamp it through a toaster. As long as it sounds good on the record, that's what you want, you know, as long as you can hear everything. So we'll get examples of different sounds mixed with our stuff, and then you just want to know that the, the guitar sound itself is coming through. What, what makes the guitar clear? Which one sounds the clearest and is bringing out, you know, the riffs the, the way they need to be? And that's the important part. So, you know... We're not... We're, we're not tech guys. We're not gear guys. A lot of people come up to us and they start talking shop. And, you know, I, me specifically, I'm definitely not. A t I mean, I know what I like. I know what, what I need to, how to achieve my sound. And that's it. But I'm not a very gear oriented person. You know, I'm very, I have what I have and I've been using it for a long time, you know. But, uh, and the same thing goes in the studio. We've, you know, we're pretty much green. We've learned a lot over the years, but uh, we rely on, you know, Paul's uh, knowledge and his ear to help, you know, help us through that process. Our job is to get in there and play the songs as tight as possible, you know, and yeah. and make sure everything, anything on end is right. And, you know, and then we have to listen to make sure it sounds good. But, uh, yeah, we're not like uh, super gearheads, so. Yeah, we do the best we can. And luckily we have, you know, the guys that we have between Paul and, and Zach and what they do. Uh you know, they, they're the ones that have that technical ability, technical ability to, to really get the sounds that we need. And, and again, you know, it's, it's just a matter of listening to the stuff. You listen to what it is and, and if it sounds good, that's all that matters. I don't care where the sounds come from. As long as it sounds good in the end, that's what matters. Totally. Um, yeah, I see someone knows Mark Mastery lives right down the road. Say what's up to Mark, man. Tell him we yeah. gave him a shout out, man. Mark's, Mark was an, a good friend of ours a long time ago, man, in the early days of Rotterdam. Now I know Christian uh, Easley is uh, is carrying the torch with Rotterdam, the drummer from uh, Rotterdam now. And, uh, Christian. Christian. Oh, boy, Christian, man. U.S. Air Force, man. Got to respect the guy. Um, well, let's see. 
How do your parents react to you producing death metal? <laughs> I got to tell you, uh, our parents over the years, I mean, they put up with a lot, you know, and totally. the funny thing is, is that just a couple of years ago, you know, you know, the role between, I don't know, 65 and 80. <laughs> and, Hell uh, yeah, totally. My and mom... they came out to the show. So, I mean, they came out to the show, hung out with our friends. At the time, I think uh, we were playing with Krizian, right? Krizian, and totally. And they were hanging out with the boys in Krizian, and, and it was great. I mean, you know, we couldn't totally. ask for more support. I mean, they totally. really... Uh, we have, we're very lucky, man. Our parents are great. I mean, Bob's uh, parents uh, are awesome. Uh, my mom is uh, 82, and uh, my aunt and uncle are in their 70s, and, uh, you know, Steve's uh, parents and, and Bill's parents came out to see us. Yep, uh, yep. You know, Steve's mom hasn't come out and see it, seen us yet, but... Uh, she's had us over for dinner. She's had us over and for she, dinner. She's a hell of a cook. Absolutely. <laughs> so, yeah, our parents are, are very uh, supportive of us. I mean, when we first started, I don't think they really understood what it was about and they thought like i think most parents that it was a a passing phase it was something we would eventually grow out of but um i think when they started seeing the fan mail now remember this is pre-internet when we started but when they started seeing the mail come in from uh you know every country all over the globe um you know uh, they were like, wow, what do you guys have fans in these countries? You've never even left Yonkers yet. How do you have fans over there? But And that was the power of the underground. And I think, um, I, I don't think they uh, saw that, you know, at the beginning until it started to kick in. And then once we signed with Roadrunner, it slowly started to become a reality, you know. And that, now they're just very proud and supportive, you know. My mom is, uh, like I said, she's 82, and she's like, uh, you know, my, my biggest uh, PR person, <laughs> you know, and, I, oh, and I'm so not like that. I don't like any, any kind of attention. I kind of like to, you know, disappear into the shadows when it comes to that shit, totally. you know, but she's always like, oh, well, my son's in a van, and I'm just like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but they've been really cool. I mean, I remember we used to practice, uh, uh, you know, at my house, up in one of the bedrooms, and man, oh, I don't even wow. know. I I can't even understand how the hell the name is dealt with it because how we his making... father, his father Tony, man, dealt with that shit uh, for years. It's just unbelievable because the the amount of noise we probably made. I mean, the houses are pretty close together, and wow. I mean, I can't even imagine. Yeah. I hear, you know. When you just hear someone uh, down the block with a loud radio, you're like, wow, why is that guy pumping his radio? Meanwhile, we were like destroying the neighborhood and the neighborhood behind us and the neighborhood down below. And man, I mean, they put up with a lot of stuff. So, uh, yep, I can only say that all the parents have been pretty damn supportive and uh, pretty lucky about that. <laughs> so let's see. What else do we got here? Uh, wait, I was down here. Hang on. Park Master, Cannibal Corpse. Uh, Napalm Death, how is it possible to get a tour? Yeah, it is a great tour. Cannibal Corpse and oh, Napalm yeah. Death. Uh, you can't do too much better than that. Nah. Great I mean, people. Awesome. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're personal friends with them. I mean, they're really good guys. I mean, we have a lot of respect for them, uh, for both of the bands. And uh, the, we did like four tours with Cannibal Corpse when the Vile album came out. So we spent about, you know, four months, uh, you know, on a bus with these guys. Uh, so we got to know them pretty well. They're awesome. They really are awesome people. Uh, they, they never let their success get to their heads. They're very grounded. Yeah, very down to earth. Very, I mean, they, they love, they, they're very passionate about the music, and they love their fans. I mean, I have a lot of respect for those guys, and the Same Napalm group guys. Napalm, too. Napalm guys, man, we toured them when? 2010 in 2010, Europe. they had us out, and it was great because, man. you know, it is difficult to get a bunch of bands together that, you know, you normally would think is not a problem, and... and Thing is, you know, it's just there's a lot of things within, I guess, the industry that kind of prevent that, and it's tough because there's different booking agents and there's so many things involved other than the band, so it's just the way it is. But like for instance, Napalm Death, you know, they just called us personally and were like, "Hey, we want you to come out on the road." So we're like, "Okay, yeah. great," you know, and that's yeah. what we did. We had a great tour, and now Decibel, you know, put this all together. I'm sure with you know the help of Cannibal and Napalm, and and we got on sure, the and it's I mean, awesome, you know. So for for us to be together with those guys, for us, it's just like. I mean, it's a it's a dream tour for us too to go out. Totally. With, you know, two great bands that are good friends of ours, and you know. Well, yeah. Like I've, I've I've been saying in interviews, it's it's not only is it a strong package, but for us, it's a really fun tour to be out with people that we know and like, and we get along really well with. Um, everybody's pretty much like minded. We're all on the same page musically, and it's uh, it's fun. You know, at this point in the game. 
you really want to go out and uh, have a good time. You know, it's like, you know, we work so much at home and, you know, we're always constantly busy. So to step outside of uh, reality and to jump into fantasy land and to be with people who are very cool, who you respect. And, you know, before you even start the tour, it's going to be a very smooth tour. And there's going to be no issues, no problems. Uh, we are all there for the same purpose, and that is to just deliver the goods every night. And uh, we all intend to, you know, and I have no doubt it's going to be a solid tour. It would be a cool tour to bring to Europe, you know. Hopefully that will happen. That would be good. A lot of people have said, wow, what a great tour. Why don't you guys bring this tour to Europe? Uh, so, you know, that's obviously not our call, but uh, it would be it, – it's a phenomenal yeah, lineup, awesome. you know. Uh, Re-releasing Stepping on Angels Before Dawn. Charles. Yeah, of course we got it. It's our songs. I mean, they're the demo songs. We, you know, we may do that this year, kid. Look we'll out. see what happens. But first, Coming we'll, soon. we'll have Providence with us on the U.S. tour. So we're finally going to release Providence. So that's the first release we're going to do. Totally, totally. And then uh, Stepping on Angels, maybe, you know, in the near future. Maybe next year sometime. We'll see. Somebody from Quebec says, what's up? A uh, friend of Luke LeMay. Luke is the man. Good friend. Yep. He drew our first shirt. Yep. Awesome. Our first to loss for the second demo, but he drew the white shirt. He drew that the demo cover for that. Luke LeMay drew that. He's been a good friend. We just saw him in uh, Belgium at the Metal Mean Fest uh, last summer. Mm -hmm. First time we, we've seen Luke in a yeah, while. It's been a but, while. But it was like uh, we, we didn't uh, we skip a beat. I mean, it was like we just saw him yesterday. He's a good guy. So say what's up to Luke, please, for us. How long have I been growing my hair? 27 years how long you been growing your hair i'm about eight hours right eight now. eight hours so yeah so he's got a he's got a little time on me i'm working on it start starting now <laughs> let's uh, see portugal yeah i mean we did the swr fest which was great i mean yeah uh, that was a good one that was a, what, a couple of years ago a couple of years ago the organizers of that fest were uh awesome really good people uh they treated us really well we had a great time, so hopefully we'll be back. Um, we didn't hit Portugal on the Marduk run, huh? Nope. nope. No. We did like five shows in Spain. I know that. And then, uh, yeah, for some reason we didn't hit there. Yeah. But that Not only tells me that hopefully on the next run that we do this coming January, uh, hopefully we will hit it, you know? Yeah. I mean... Uh, Unfortunately, a lot of these places, it, it's never really up to us, you know, the uh, uh, massive music books, the tours, and... You know, it's they might not have been able to find a promoter at the time. You know, it, it all depends a lot on what what they have to do and how they have to do it. And it's not easy. I know it's not easy making you know booking these tours. And uh, so it all depends on if they have a contact there or not. You know, maybe uh, the contact that they had for Portugal just wasn't uh, doing shows anymore, and maybe they didn't get a new one yet. So again, you know, I'm only guessing, but uh, I know they try and get us into as many countries and places as they can. Um, you know, we'll just have to wait and see what happens. Anyone else? All right. Uh, no, that's more up to date than this. This one. is more up to date. Okay. So let's see. They're got. coming in really quick. The question. So if we if we skip you guys, it's just yeah. they just keep coming in. So I'm trying to not skip around. But unfortunately, uh, ah, what are your influences when it comes to write lyrics? The just world, life in general. <laughs> yeah, life in general. I mean. I think you can look around you at any given moment and, and find something negative to write about, unfortunately. It's a sad it's a sad statement, but it's it's unfortunately true. I mean, so a lot of the lyrics, especially for the new record, are, are derived from what we see in the world today, what's happening, what's been happening for the last number of years. And, uh, yeah, uh, I, and uh, along with that, there's another question here that uh, said, is there continuity in the subject material between the new record and Majesty and Decay? Uh, there's always a continuity, I think, sure. from one, the first record to this one, there's always some kind of continuity, and we talked about that earlier, um, but especially with Majesty, of course, and Providence. And Providence. Sense. I think these are all kind of like, I think we're looking at, because we tend to look more at like what's going on today now, and, uh, uh, and especially a lot of the more social type of things, but, you know, in a darker way, you know, um, you know, the issues of what's happening with our governments with our the institutions sure everything. Uh, the the economies around the world uh there's a lot there's a lot of real negative things going on and i think a lot of this happens because 
uh, as people, we get distracted. There's there's so many distractions uh, in our world today, you know, from our little uh, computerized phones uh, <laughs> to emails and texts and social yep. media and the TV shows and the movies and all, all this other stuff that keep everybody distracted while all the really bad shit is happening under the radar, you know, and that's a fact. I mean, there's a lot of things that are happening, uh, you know, and it's, it's very disheartening, but for every negative thing that I see happening, there's always a group of people that are fighting back and trying to uh, make things right so uh, you know there is hope you know I th I, I think <laughs> I would like to think so but I mean you know we're just I think at a very weird point in our history right now and uh, so that's basically what the new album's about um, uh, yeah and we touched on some of that as well you know a lot of the uh, the deeper seedier uh, sides of uh, of the world uh, you know, we try not to get too political because we've never been a political band, um, but there are a lot of political undertones in a lot of our records. Uh, they're there. I mean, they, you know, they may not be obviously obvious, but they are there. So, uh, but it's it, it's all, it, I think it all is part of the the big picture. You know, it's it's all up to us. I mean, it's a, anything that's happening is, uh, you know, really comes down to our, our lack of being part of something positive to push against it or just our not caring. So, so anyway, so yeah, without getting uh, too into a rant about that, that, yeah, there is definitely a continuity like Bob said. Yeah, absolutely. Throughout. All right. Uh, let's see. You guys have been putting out records very steadily since Steve joined the band on Harnessing Ruin. Is there any struggle to push the envelope with albums coming out every two years, or is it a natural process that you've become accustomed to? I guess it is more of a natural thing. It's like we just, I mean, Steve definitely pushes the envelope, and he's always pushing us. So, I mean, as long as he's ready to go, you know, we're ready. I mean, uh, as far as the intensity, I think Steve has taken us to a place that we probably would have never gotten before without him. Um... And anything I throw at him, he pretty much, you know, uh, like I'm writing stuff on the computer, so it's easy for me, but he has to play it. So, I mean, he takes that as a challenge, and he does it, and he takes it to even a higher level. So, uh, uh, yeah, Steve plays a, a big role in, in, in taking things up a notch. Um, but it's more of a natural thing. I mean, with every record we write, we just, you know, we try and make things more interesting, more intense. Uh, so it all comes naturally, you know, the, the feeling, the, the emotion, the intensity, the heaviness, the darkness. We're, we're always trying to expand on that. So. The unique the unique thing about Steve's input is is the fact that he is a fan of Emily. He's an Emil fan, you know. He When he was younger, he, he listened to our earlier records. So he's... Uh, in addition to bringing his talent, he's bringing uh, that fan's perspective in. So he always, uh, he's always like that anchor that makes sure we don't stray, you know, even though we're aware of it, but yeah. he'll always, uh, you know, make suggestions, uh, you know, you know, as a fan, for example, he'll say, you know, you know, maybe we should do more of this, or I think, you know, maybe, as, you know, the older fans are like, and we, you know, we always take that into account. Yep. Uh, not that we, we lose track of that, but sometimes it's hard to kind of get sidetracked and, to, you know, when you're in writing new stuff, you know, you're always focused on like, you know, that forward momentum, you know, and you have to kind of, uh, you know, step back and say, okay, you know, we don't want to lose the essence of what we're about. And I think Steve is uh, a good, uh, yeah, he's definitely a big helper in that. Yeah. And, and just keeping an eye on that. I mean, that goes with anything really. I mean, all the songs, uh, when I, when I get them together, for me, it's like, uh, you know, the first, uh, the first judgment comes with, you know, between Ross and Steve and Bill. You know, oh, he's, like, that's you it. Think, like, <laughs> you think you guys are bad or, or the magazines, you know, we're the worst critics for yeah, him, totally. you know? Because, I mean, I'm just like, I don't know about this one. And, you know, and they'll be like, oh, no, it's good. Or I'll be like, I think this is good. And they'll be like, no. He's, he's <laughs> so. his worst critic, though. I mean, you know, so many times you've come to me and like, I don't know about this one. And I'd be like, dude, what are you talking yeah. about? That's on fire. Well, We're definitely going to use that. It's tough. Well, as anyone that writes music knows, you know, you try not to, one, repeat yourself. Two, you want to make stuff that's going to sound right or sound the way you want it to sound. It's got to be heavy. It's got to be dark. So it's, sometimes it's just when you're writing like, you know, 80 this... to 100 riffs over a two-month period, you, you right. just... You just they're coming out like left and right, so but really, you tend to like uh, if you write, question yourself a little bit more. If you write a hundred riffs, maybe, maybe we don't use 
90 of them. No, no we don't <laughs> use five of them, you know, or 10 of them. I mean, really, I yeah, most of the times he nails it, you know. And the few that we don't use, you know, even he's like, yeah, I don't know. Or, you know, sometimes you'll like a riff and we'll be like, eh, I don't know, dude. You know, yeah, it happens, totally you know, but that's all right. I mean, it is what it is, you know. I mean, when you're writing stuff, you're always kind of like, oh, man, this I love this. And then if the guys are like, yeah, not so much, then... It's kind of hard for me, it is, but, you know, I let it well, go. He, but that's okay, because when you're writing so much stuff and you take it to heart, you know, you're like, oh, this, I thought this was going to be great, you know, and then Steve will be like, nah, I don't know about that one, you know, and then, and then I'm like, oh, man, you know, and then I'm like, all right, you know, and then in the, in the end, they're, they're absolutely okay. right, so. Uh, well, that happened, you know, we did that once in, uh, when we were recording Failures for Gods. When we were recording uh, No Jesus, No Beast in the studio, that song had a whole other section oh, in it yeah. that was really bad. It was like <laughs> really, when it came in, it we was very... It right in the studio. It was very happy sounding, and it really didn't fit the song. And while we were actually tracking it, like I was kind of making fun of it, and Bob looked at me, and he's like, wait, wait, wait. He's like, all yeah, right, we're going we to kill that part. And, we'll, it, and at that point, it was different because we are actually recording together in the studio. We were recording live. We weren't recording the guitars and the bass, but the way we did things back then was... Scratch tracks. Steve would play, and we'd play along with him so he could play... Well, Alex songs. at the time. Was I mean, Alex. All right, I'm sorry. My bad. See, Steve feels like he's been since the beginning. Yeah, so totally. So anyway, uh, Alex would be playing the drums, and, and we're playing... That It was a different situation, so we're all sitting there in the studio playing together uh, so Alex could get the parts down. And then... You have no choice but to make the change right there and then, you know, and, and you're, you're sitting there in the studio and then you're like, all right, hold on, Paul, uh, we just have to rewrite the song for a second. You know? Totally. <laughs> so, so, you know what happens. Did? It does happen. Cut that shit right out of the song. Done. Yep, yep. <laughs> and that's happened over the course of almost every record. I mean, there's always been points where even this last record, um, you know, there was a few parts that... Uh, Steve would be concerned about it as well as Ross of being too long because they weren't sure, quite yeah. sure what I was going to do to take up the space that was going sure. on. And we don't know where the lyrics and the vocals are going to go exactly until the songs are done uh, once Ross does his vocals. So uh, we pretty much got to a point with one of these tracks that, you know, uh, I think the vocals were done already and it was just a matter of a musical part and I just was luckily now we could do that i just told paul yeah we're gonna drop or i think zach had the stuff at the time i'm like yeah just drop about eight bars of that and uh and yeah from there so it's kind of cool we can now it's easier to do that i mean that's right we did do that in this the, record the first time we did it uh digitally it was at probably uh, close to world below uh, i'm sure we made some changes on that record too but it always happens because you don't know what the stuff's going to sound like at least the way we do things until it's actually recorded and the vocals and everything are on top of it and then you know, so I know when I'm going to do leads and, and extra uh, overlay guitar parts, some are already done and they're going to work, and then other ones I'm not quite sure about, and that's when you realize, you're like, yeah, this is way too long, so you cut it down, and, and, and in the end, it comes out better, and, and Steve's really had a big part in that over the past few years of, you know, saying, hey, you know, um, you know, you don't need to play stuff like a million times, you know, <laughs> and he's right, you know, well, yeah, you get caught up in it sometimes and you think it's going to work, but it doesn't. Yeah, it just gets, it's just a little too much and it does get, it gets boring and monotonous, you know, and we learn, listen, we learn from our mistakes, you know what I'm saying? I mean, we try never to, uh, uh, to rehash any older shit and revisit stuff that we know it isn't, isn't going to work, so... But yeah, Steve is definitely like, you know, yeah, you know, you might want to consider cutting that down or, yeah, you know, yeah. so. But that's good, good, though. Absolutely. We're, we're usually, for the most part, on the same page, like 98% of the time, you know, and 2% of the time, you know, you know, usually one or two of us are like not into something and, you know. You have to, you know. You have to be It's flexible. a give and take. It's a give and yeah. take. And you have to realize that. Um, every person in the band, every opinion matters, you know, and it's, sure. you have to look at it that way, you know, so if, if one person's like, uh, oh, this is the way, you know, like if I'm writing something, I'm like, wow, this is really the way it's got to be, guys, I think I feel real strongly about that, and everyone else is like, well, I could go either way, I don't know, you know, so then I'm just like, all right, forget it's like, it, you know. Bob's really not a dictator. And then <laughs> it's just like, all right, you know, you just kind of say, all right, I'm going to go with that, and eventually I know that they're right, so, and more and more with every record, I just... You know, I trust these guys, uh, you know, their opinions even that much more every time. Because as soon as I hear one thing, I'm just like, yeah, now we'll dump it, you know, and that's it. Uh, I think the hardest song on this record was um, uh, track seven. I can't remember the name of it now. Spectacle? Spectacle of Lies. Lies. That one was a total lemon, you know. It was like, yeah, I wrote it, yeah. and I think I had it written before we went away to Europe. South America. Right. 
it was written and Steve, unfortunately, I already had him, you know, he was already rehearsing it. And then by the time I got back from there and wrote a bunch of other stuff down there, I told him, I'm like, yeah, that one's going to be completely rehashed because it had to be completely redone because it didn't really reflect the rest of the songs all sounded like what they should be. And that one was just totally like it was the, odd, happening. the odd duck out. Yeah. Totally. So I pretty much rewrote the whole thing. And then uh, I think once I did that, you know, Steve loved it a whole lot more as well as everybody else. So oh, it's a great song. You know, I mean, now um, it's like one definitely one. We're of my playing favorites. that one live. We played it on the cruise. It's a very powerful song, you know. So, yeah, so, you know, things change up until the last minute, uh, you know, with the recording process. It's just the way it is, but, uh, all right. Let's see what else we got here. We don't want to keep you guys on too long, so I'll... Yeah, I'll we don't know what our, our time... I mean, we could we could yap all night. <laughs> I don't think anybody wants that. <laughs> so, let's just see. We got diarrhea of the mouth tonight. <laughs> uh if you could set a band on fire, which one would it be? <laughs> That's just a funny question. That's a great question. <laughs> There's a few. There's a few. Let's see. Oh, well, who were the players that inspired both of you to pick up instruments and stuff? And, well, as mentioned, you know, I think Maiden probably had a big part. Like Ross mentioned earlier, Steve Harris, and I think uh, definitely Dave Murray from Smith. Maiden was like, and, and Adrian Smith. Yeah, both. Smith and Murray. On me. I think Maiden was probably one of the biggest influences on, on us. Totally. As, I as fucking, far as actually playing, you know, so. I fucking love Maiden, man. I grew up listening to Maiden. Phenomenal. All the earlier stuff is just phenomenal. I saw them on the Power Slave tour with Queensryche. Yeah. Yeah, it was a fucking great show. How was that show? <laughs> Be bothering me that for the rest of my life. <laughs> tonight, you gotta give them the the history on that one. So Maiden did about seven nights on the Power Slave tour at Radio City Music Hall, which is, like, you know, it's like a theater, you know, it's not, you know, they don't usually do metal shows there. So that was in and of itself unique. So I had tickets for two nights. It was in January. It was like super cold the night I went. So I saw an earlier performance and they had added a couple of shows on and I had tickets for one of the later performances. Bob had a ticket for one of the later performances as well. So... I saw them the first night, the coldest night of the year. They were phenomenal. Queensryche opened up. Uh, it was the warning, right? For the warning. Yeah, so it was like phenomenal. Phenomenal. That was a great tour. It's like Queensryche, the warning, and like uh, Power Slave for uh, yeah. Maiden. Probably two, one of my two favorite yeah. albums. You, it doesn't get any better for that. And the funny thing is, we, we didn't know each other back then. We didn't know each other. And uh, so then... My show, got, my show got canceled. <laughs> Dickinson got he sick. Got my show flu. got canceled. And we were like just about to head out to the show and we heard it got canceled. We were like, really? You know, so and it was, they had a makeup show at the yeah, garden, which was which actually pretty had cool. Accept, which was cool because I wasn't into Accept at the time as well. But, but he missed he missed That the combination show. of, uh, you know, Queen's Rec Warning and uh, Power Slave Iron Maiden, I missed out on that one. So I bust his balls <laughs> to this day. <laughs> like, oh, it was a great show. And he's like, you're a dick. <laughs> All right, and on that note, I think uh, we'll call it a night. Yeah. Um, we had a good time. Thanks for listening to us uh, sit here for the past hour and a half. Yep. Thanks, and, guys. Uh, uh, definitely check out the new record. I, we really think you're going to like it. If you're a fan of Immolation or Extreme Metal of any kind, I think you'll dig it. But obviously, we got all Immolation fans here. and uh, Totally. It's I don't dark. think you'll be let down. I think you'll really dig it. If you like Majesty, if you like Providence, uh, you're going to love this record. It's dark, heavy, and miserable, just like us. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I guess we'll see you uh, next time. Hopefully we'll see you on the road coming up on the uh, Cannibal Napalm Tour. And uh, yeah. we'll see you then. Thanks for everything. Thank and you, guys. See you. Thanks ya. for all the support. See you on the road. All right, guys.